Thank you for joining everyone. Um, my name is uh, Jane Kelly. I'm the Director of Sales and Marketing with the University of Toronto Press. Uh, I want to welcome you all to the launch of the story of CO2, Big Ideas for a Small Molecule, uh, written by Jeffrey Ozen and Mire Gusub. Uh, this is the fourth book to be launched from our trade imprint, AVO UTP. And uh, we're very excited to be launching this brand new book today. Uh, today's discussion will be moderated by Tyler Hamilton of uh, the Mars. Uh, before we get started though, uh, we will just have our uh, land acknowledgement statement, which I will read. Uh, so, uh, University of Toronto Press wishes to acknowledge this land on which we operate. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississauga of the Credit River. Mm -hmm. Today, the, this meeting place is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. So before we get started, I'm just going to uh, introduce uh, Tyler Hamilton from uh, the Mars. And uh, Tyler is the Director of Ecosystem Clean Tech. Previous to joining Mars, uh, Tyler spent two decades as a journalist and wrote extensively about Canada's clean technology sector and global clean tech trends. Most recently, he was the editor-in-chief of business and sustainability magazine, Corporate Nights. He also spent 13 years at the Toronto Star, and in 2011, he authored the book called Mad Like Tesla, a book that examines the various barriers to clean energy innovation and surveys the landscape of some potentially world-changing clean technologies. So Tyler, I'm going to uh, hand it over to you. Thank you, Jane, and thank you everybody for uh, for joining us this afternoon. Um, it, it's my pleasure to moderate this this book launch. Uh, when I was first approached about doing so, um, I was excited about the topic because it's something that, in my role today uh, at Mars Discovery District, um, that that I that I deal with all the time. We we work with over two hundred ventures across Canada many of which are trying to do something with this uh, miraculous chemical, um, this miraculous molecule, um, everything from capturing it uh, from the air to synthesizing it into uh, new types of uh, clean fuels to creating uh, physical materials um, that can be used for construction. There's a whole range of things that are happening today that are exciting and you're gonna learn about them um, in this book and as well as uh, over the next hour. Um, so with that, I just wanna give a little background to uh, the two authors of the story of CO2, um, starting with Jeff Ozen, uh, who is a distinguished professor um, at the University of Toronto and Government of Canada Research Chair in Materials Chemistry and Nanochemistry. Um, he currently leads the solar fuels team at the University of Toronto. And as a reporter in my, in my previous life, um, I was constantly calling him for insights into the, the research that he was doing and, and uh, writing stories about some of that research. Um, Jeff is the recipient of many national and international awards that have been recognized, uh, that have recognized his work in defining, enabling, and popularizing a chemical approach to nanomaterials for innovative nanotechnology in advanced materials and biomedical science. Uh, he has around 30 papers in Nature and Science and publishes uh, monthly opinion editorials in Advanced Science News. Now, his co-author, um, Marae Gassoub, she holds a PhD in Materials Chemistry from the University of Toronto. Her research is focused on the study of reaction pathways on the surface of metal oxide catalysts for converting carbon dioxide into methanol. Another one of those neat uses of carbon dioxide, which you'll learn about. <laughs> uh, she completed her bachelor's of science in engineering physics at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver and her master's of science in materials science and engineering <clears throat> at the University of Toronto. So it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce you to, uh, to these two co-authors 
And what I'm going to do at this point is hand it over to each of them for five minutes just to answer the question, why did you write this book? Um, and I'd like to start with Jeff. Take it away, Jeff. Thanks, Tyler. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, you might be curious about the book title, uh, The Story of CO2. The story begins with a visit from my six-year-old grandson, Jacob, who had a school assignment to interview an inventor. I took him to my lab to show him how we collect CO2 from thin air and find new ways to convert it into useful things like fuels and other chemicals, just by adding a pinch of sunlight and some hydrogen. On his tour, he said, Grandpa, isn't CO2 a bad molecule that scientists say is causing our planet to get hotter and hotter? I was impressed by his comment and eventually convinced him that chemical inventions can turn something that we think is bad into something good. He still wasn't satisfied. He said, that's a fantastic invention, Gramps. So why aren't we doing it? The point of this story is that my six-year-old grandson totally got it. And when he showed his video to his teachers and fellow classmates, they got it too. Jacob helped me realize that the time was right for telling the story of CO2, a story that everyone should read and understand because the most pressing issue facing humanity today is the climate emergency. Therefore, in this last phase of my career, I decided to launch a focused research, education and outreach program on carbon dioxide, chemical and engineering solutions to climate change. Like many others, I had my eye on CO2 as something good and not something bad. CO2 as an asset, not a liability. CO2 as a valuable chemicals feedstock, not an inconvenient waste product. CO2 as a key enabler of the transition from non-renewable to renewable forms of energy to ensure a sustainable future for humankind. This research vision turned out to be a much larger undertaking than I ever imagined for a simple chemist and a simple three atom molecule. First, it requires a deep understanding of the big picture of harvesting, storing and utilizing CO2. From the science and technology to sociology, economics, justice, law, policy and governance. Second, it turns out that making useful stuff from CO2 is not a piece of cake. Why? Because CO2 is the most stable molecule on our planet and coercing it to make useful products, dare I say for a profit, is a recipe involving renewable forms of energy, creative chemistry, and a multidisciplinary team of talented materials chemists, scientists, and engineers. This new green eco-friendly way of making chemicals, pharmaceuticals, polymers, fertilizers, cements, and fuels using CO2 as a feedstock is the logical way forward. It's an integral part of our renewable energy mix and transition to a sustainable future. The science and engineering possibilities in this field are booming. Spin-off companies are flourishing. Major emitting industries are, gen are getting involved and governments around the world are beginning to take this innovation seriously as part of their climate change um, policies, plan. and strategies, sorry, aimed at achieving net zero by 2030. So just to end, what's my message today? Listen to your grandchildren. Give them hope how they can live in a world free from climate threats and make them laugh like I tried with my only published poem, Ode to Carbon Dioxide, O oh, Small Molecule, to love or to hate, to understand you better, before it's too late and we all become CO2. So this is my story, the story of CO2. And I wanna give many thanks to all of those involved in helping to make it happen. 
Thanks, Jeff. Do you want to, uh, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll pass it off to Marae who can explain why she got involved, how she got involved in this project <laughs> and, and what, uh, what motivated her to, to take on this uh, enormous uh, uh, initiative. Having written a book in the past, I know how much work it is, so I commend you for that. Yeah, thanks. So um, unlike Jeff, I'm a millennial, um, and I'm sure like you know, many of my generation, it feels like we've been talking about climate forever. Um, I remember watching An Inconvenient Truth in school and feeling deeply concerned about global warming. And I really took to heart messaging about pollution reduction, which was really like the main way in which the issue was articulated at the time, I think. Um, I did a science fair project when I was 11 where I attempted to make biodegradable cups out of mud and uh, glue, and it really failed. Um, <laughs> good thing I moved on. Uh, so fast forward many years and I was doing a master's degree in applied science at the University of Toronto. And at the time, the group I was working with was collaborating with Jeff. Uh, and Jeff had just launched the Solar Fuels Initiative at the university, and I was uh, totally hooked on the idea. So I decided to join for uh, my doctoral studies. And one day, about a year into my program, I don't know, Jeff, if you remember this, but Jeff approached me and he was like, I have a secret. And I bet I was a little concerned, but then he said, I'm writing a book and I would like you to be my co-author. And perhaps my naive first year self was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and many, many versions and rewrites and edits later, here we are. So, you know, as Jeff said, the story of CO2 is very much a story about climate. Um, globally, we release on the order of 35 gigatons of CO2 per year, and the science has now been clear for decades that these emissions are directly responsible for changing our climate. And we know that it's critical that global temperature rise not exceed 1.5 degrees, um, to, you know, if we're going to avoid any catastrophic effects. And meeting this target requires that we uh, you know, get our emissions to net zero by 2050. And that's just around the corner. So, you know, there are many things that need to happen if we're to reach net zero. And the most important is transitioning to renewable forms of energy, you know, and things like electrifying our transport systems. Um, and other, you know, important strategies also include retrofitting buildings and engaging in land restoration. But despite our best efforts, you know, it's becoming abundantly clear that in addition to mitigating emissions, some degree of carbon removal will be necessary to meet our targets and also to address the impact of legacy emissions. So this is where the story of CO2 comes in. Um, the book explores from a chemist's perspective uh, the many ways in which, um, in addition to avoiding emissions, we need to work with CO2 to capture it, um, to store it, and in some cases to transform it. So my framework was certainly challenged during my research for this book. And, you know, we absolutely must reduce our emissions, but the solution also requires that we view CO2 as more than just waste. And understanding its chemistry is really critical to developing, you know, safe storage technologies and ultimately, you know, for, for finding out, um, figuring out how to place CO2 within a circular economy, you know, a, an economy where waste is viewed as a resource, um, where extractive industries are minimized, and where our health and the health of our environment are treated as the bottom line. Hopefully that wasn't too long of an intro. Excellent. Oh, that's great. Um, great. Well, I'll just launch into uh, questions. And, uh, and then, you know, I would remind the audience that uh, for, the, for the final 15, 20 minutes of this, we'll be uh, asking any questions that you put through the chat. So we'll be monitoring that. So keep that in mind. Um, but I'll start off by asking each of you, and, and, and Jeff, you hinted to this, about the challenge, like the CO2 is a, is a chemically stable, the most chemically stable molecule. Um, for, the, for the lay person, what does that mean, like in terms of stable and why is it difficult? Why is it challenging to transform it into value added product? Well, uh, basically, um, there are some reactions that are fairly energy um, facile. For example, mineralization is one idea. So this would be one way of storing CO2 
aqueous solutions like Perrier water, carbonized water, which can react with minerals in the ground. So this is one way of storing CO2, for example, which is important, as well as geological storage and ocean that, uh, ocean, and storing uh, under the ocean. Um, but most of the reactions are thermodynamically uphill. And so that means they need energy to drive them. So um, if you want to make, for example, sustainable fuels uh, for hard to decarbonize um, fossils, for example, aviation fuel would be one that would be hard to decarbonize unless we go over to aviation driven by fuel cells or batteries, but passenger planes, um, batteries are gonna to be too heavy. Um, maybe fuel cells are, are possible. Um, but basically we need some source of hydrogen in order to convert the carbon dioxide into something useful, whether it's a chemical, a material, a fuel, a pharmaceutical, a polymer, as we were mentioning. Um, and one way of getting sustainable hydrogen is using renewable energy and electrochemistry, right? And so electrolysis is um, an industrial process now. It will be a key part of the hydrogen economy, uh, which is also uh, something that's thriving. Um, but basically we're gonna need a renewable form of energy like electricity, light or heat, not fossil, in order to drive these reactions. Um, people worry about the cost of hydrogen renewable hydrogen from electrochemistry, for example. But these days the price is coming down or it's on par with steam reforming of natural gas, which is the reaction of, of methane and, um, and steam to give carbon dioxide and hydrogen. And there lies the problem. You can get the hydrogen, but you generate lots of carbon dioxide. So as Murray mentioned, we need ways to somehow cycle this in a sort of carbon neutral. So, so you, you mentioned hydrogen a lot there. So I'll ask Murray to answer this. Like, so, so energy is required to extract or separate the CO2 from other gases or air or whatever, yeah. but then it's required again to synthesize it with other elements or chemicals to create something new, right? And that's where the, that's where the energy intensity um, issue comes into play, right? Yeah, exactly. There are, you know, at every step in the supply chain, there's going to be an energy requirement. Um, you know, it's interesting you mentioned specifically, like, the need to, to separate out CO2. Um, so one part of this question, even though it's not necessarily the concern of our research, um, is the need to capture CO2, mm -hmm. right? So the, uh, you know, if you really want to make the process carbon neutral or carbon negative, so um, capturing can either involve um, direct air capture, so that's drawing CO2 directly from the air, and alternatively, um, it can involve point source capture. So that is, um, as you described, more like filtering um, out, removing CO2 in a more concentrated form from, say, an industrial waste source, um, like a fluid stream. So, um, so these are two, um, two sources of, say, waste CO2 uh, that we can uh, make use of potentially. Uh, already there are, um, I believe, on the order of like 20 large scale CO2 um, capture projects globally um, that are uh, essentially integrated with, um, you know, either coal fired um, gas plants or some big industrial operation to, uh, to capture um, any CO2 emissions coming up. So the idea um, chemically though, the, the more dilute the source, the harder to capture the CO2. So it's easier to, to capture from more concentrated sources. Yeah. Like, like something coming out of a gas engine versus like a, a natural gas engine versus just direct air where the concentration is lower. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, so, so um, you know, one of the things that, you know, lies behind all of that is the fact that we're going to need that energy input and that energy input has to be cleaned for it to work whether it's renewable or clean electricity or some kind of renewable or clean source of thermal energy 
Um, or like in the case of one of the companies that has spun out of your lab, Jeff uh, Solistra, which uses a catalytic, uh, a solar catalytic approach. So it reacts with sunlight. So, but whatever the approach, um, it's only really beneficial if we've got those, those clean emission-free inputs or low, low emission inputs, right? Yeah, that's correct. Um, and so any carbon utilization technology, um, one of the things we tend not to think about is how much carbon is used in the actual process. And so we may be utilizing carbon dioxide, but we have to worry about, you know, uh, you know what's the so-called carbon footprint. And these are quite difficult things to do. One has to do complete so-called life cycle analyses from cradle all the way through to the grave um, and so forth uh, for every molecule, every material involved in the process. Um, so that comes into the story. Okay. Um, so, so, so we, we talked about we we talked about the products that could be made from utilizing CO two. Um, I'm curious to know what each of you think. What would be the most impactful product? You know, whether it be a fuel or some kind of, you know. Uh, carbon-based material that's used for construction? Like, what do you think is going to um, create the biggest impact? Um, you wanna start, Jeff? Um, I was looking, uh, this was one of the things that we had uh, listed in the book, if you remember. Um, I, we had 10, didn't we? Well, what we do, what I will say is, um, I, I do have a couple in mind that I want to mention yeah. in terms of most impactful. Uh, but one thing we we try to address um, in the book as well is, you know, how can um, like these um, these technologies, these chemical processes, um, can be impactful in many ways. Um, and in in one way, there is some degree of carbon mitigation. But in another way, in a, almost a more powerful way, they can also act to displace the use of fossil fuels in chemical manufacturing. Yes. So, um, so in the book, as, for example, we, we list um, what we've identified to be like 10 key chemicals and materials that if we can find a way of procuring these without fossil fuels, yeah. like that would be revolutionary in a way, because, you know, we often talk about the use of fossil, um, you know, as, as a fuel for, uh, for our transportation, but, Fossil fuels are completely intertwined in, in so many areas of, of our manufacturing industries. So a big message we're trying to send in the book is, um, you know, is using carbon dioxide can effectively displace fossil fuels mm. in chemical manufacturing. And in that sense, it's really powerful because it's like the ultimate, like there are no more excuses. We don't yeah. need to use fossil fuels. We have exactly. modern, you know, modern science to, um, to, to show us, well, we can do better. Um, but in terms of, you know, what are some really, uh, yeah. what are yeah. some industries where there can be major impact? One I want to mention, and I'm obviously biased <laughs> because this was the topic of my PhD, but one, <laughs> um, the production of methanol um, from CO2. And methanol, if you're not familiar with it, it's, it's a really um, amazing chemical. If you can find a way to make methanol sustainably, you can make on the order of, you know, 60% of all the feedstock chemicals in the world from methanol. So once you can, you know, it's really like a source, um, a source chemical, if you will, where if you got that, the rest of your supply chain can, could potentially be taken care of. And methanol can also be used um, as a fuel uh, itself um, for burning. Of course, that would create emissions, but but the whole point is, you know, we want to keep yeah. fossil in the ground and try to use waste carbon wherever possible to um, to complete our um, our industrial supply chain. Jeff, then, Jeff, oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to see if Jeff had anything to add to that. Um, but, you know, if you had to, if you had more to mention, keep going. I mean, um, I could talk all day, so that might not be good. <laughs> <that might> <laughs> <good. laughs> sure you could. Jeff, did you have anything to add? Well, I th there were a number of chemicals. Well, basically, Murray's got it right. I mean, we're basically trying to replace fossils in the in the chemical supply chain and so forth. And there are uh, hundreds of thousands of commodity chemicals, basically, that could be made in that way. 
Um, there are certain very energy and um, fertilizers is a very important one. You know, the fact that you can make nitrogen fertilizers required to maintain the food chain and all life on earth. Uh, probably most people don't know that it comes from carbon dioxide and ammonia. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, turning the ammonia process, which is a hundred year old ammonia process into a green process, it's incredibly um, uh, carbon intensive. I think something like um, for the production of two, don't quote me on this, but I, Marie, was it something like two gigatons of ammonia production, say globally, has associated with it? Um, maybe that number wasn't quite right, but there's something like a two gigaton CO2 footprint associated with the ammonia process. Um, cements is um, one of the major contributors. And so again, incorporating carbon dioxide into cements to make mechanically stronger cements. It means they can be lighter, they can be stronger, you need less of them. If you have a look, for example, at the amount of cement that's being used in the world, it's absolutely incredible. It's a CO2 producing process from the calcium carbonate and the high temperatures that you need. And so again, you would not want to really drive this with fossil. And so if you can sort of eliminate, you know, the fossil to drive the process and collect the CO2 and put the CO2 back into the cement. So you collect the CO2 from the cement precursors and put it back into the cement to make superior cements. And we have companies like that operating, as you know, in, in Canada. Some of yeah, actually, I well. was just, I was just about to point that out. A company that Mars works with called Carbon Cure. Um, yes. You know, it's not just a fantasy, right? They've been working on it for 10 years. And um, most recently, they got investment from the Bill Gates backed uh, Breakthrough Energy Ventures Fund, the Amazon um, Climate Pledge Fund, which is a billion dollar fund. And Amazon has said that they're going to be using their concrete for all of its buildings that it's it's planning to build across yeah. the, around the world. So, you know, this stuff is happening, right? It's not it's not fiction. Um, I yeah. think it needs to be to be scaled up. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if. Oh, sorry, Jeff. Go ahead. Uh, no, after you, Marie. I, I wanted to uh, while we're on the topic of cement, um, you know, just um, add on to what Jeff is saying. Um, where I, I think one thing it was that was certainly unfamiliar to to me um, before pursuing this area, and I think it, it's not similar to a lot of people, is that you know when we're talking about some processes like cement. Fossil fuels are not just used to, um, to power the process. They're also used as a chemical input to the process. And in the process, emissions are generated from, from just the production of cement itself. So the point being, it's um, a lot of, uh, you know, although there's a lot of focus on decarbonizing the energy sector, which, is, which absolutely must happen, an issue with decarbonizing the industrial sector is that in that case, carbon dioxide is not, um, is not only produced through, um, or rather fossil fuels are not only used to power the process, but they're used as a chemical input to actually manufacture um, uh, the, the cement. Yeah, it's, an, it's an ingredient, right? It's an ingredient. It's an ingredient. I'm sorry, in cement making, their emissions from um, are also produced in the chemical reaction. But yes, in other processes, they're also used as an ingredient. Yeah. So um, yeah, I, that's also a key message in our book is, is recognizing the many ways in which emissions are produced. It's not just for power. Yeah, and also storing renewable energy, you know, instead of just, I mean, as well as storing it, for example, in the various ways that we store renewable energy, you can store it in the energy of the chemical bond. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and so for example, if you make hydrocarbon fuels, that's a wonderful way of storing a large amount of energy and providing you recycle that fuel and so forth, uh, then, you know, you can get carbon neutrality. So it's a great way of storing, transporting, distributing um, and using. Um, and I, I suppose the challenge, though, is a lot of these chemicals and fuels are commodities that, you know, you're, you're really trying to compete against the low price that exists for fossil fuel based versions. Um, so, I, you know, some companies are starting to develop, you know, so that they can scale up, um, tackle niche areas. Uh, for example, there's a company in New York City that's, uh, you, I'm sure you've heard of called Airco that is making uh, vodka. Why, at CO2. why don't we show it to everybody? I mean, Tyler, this is 
sort of when I when this was sent to me because I wrote a story about Airco, yeah. and I held this bottle of mm. vodka in my hand that was made from thin air, and yeah. realizing that eco-friendly restaurants and liquor control, you know, the liquor stores and so forth, I think that when people realize that this liquid was made from carbon dioxide, they begin to start thinking differently about it. As it turns out, this is pure ethanol. And so this is carbon dioxide to ethanol. Murray mentioned methanol. Uh, but the point about this, it's ultra pure. There is no contaminants. So this means it can be used in the pharmaceutical industry, the food industry, the beverage industry, and so forth. And so it may not solve the climate change problem, um, but basically it's a way of creating a business, as you've mentioned, you know, for profit. So um, I guess so what I'm trying to say, there are two ways of looking at this. I mean, in the end, a business has got to make a profit. Oh, right? And it's got to be competitive with, with what exists out there. And so there are two ways of thinking about this. There are all the businesses that basically are great businesses. And there are the ones that can be scaled to maybe hundreds of millions of tons and truly make an impact. And so that's where some of the massive industries like the chemical and the petrochemical industries, the cement industries, steel, um, and so forth. This connects to agriculture and so forth. We cover basically all of these industries, uh, you know, that basically can benefit from CO2 capture and utilization. And these companies are getting quite serious, not just yep. the spin-off companies, but, you know, the major companies are getting interested in this. And, you know, one thing I do want to mention is that uh, now that we've got hopefully a change of government down in the US, it looks as if we have, I read the Climate 21 plan. I don't know if you've seen this. This is the project basically uh, that's being proposed. It's sort of like a global Manhattan project of basically dealing with the, the climate crisis. And what's involved is all of government, all of business, all of civil society, all of industry. And so I think one of the most important takeaways from our book is that we need to educate people all the way from the Jacob age all the way through to our policymakers. I've actually worked with ministers very closely. I, I won't mention any names in the solar fuels group, um, you know, that we, that we established at the University of Toronto. And I realized the knowledge gap that existed between what goes on sort of at the grassroots level mm -hmm. in a laboratory that's doing the basic science. And then you have to think of all the technology readiness levels of, of taking that basic science through to technologies and scaling and so forth, but it's got to get up to the government and the policy levels and so forth. And this is really one of the reasons we wrote the book, yeah. because I realized on working with the minister, if he would more or less understand what we do, right, and we could understand what he does, then we can make this, this energy transition happen faster more smoothly and and just bringing the public on board i mean we're hoping that that this is a book written for everybody that you can pick up at an airport you know and read it on an airplane or read it on a train and so forth and by writing it at the lay level which was incredibly difficult to do i mean i'm a hardcore scientist and i must thank Murray in public here for the way that she translated the science and expanded it into this bigger picture. That's why we talk of, you know, big ideas for a small molecule because the ideas are huge. Mm. These are global ideas. They impact everybody and people need to be informed yeah. in order to be able to vote correctly, in order to be able to talk to their, their politicians, in order to spread the news amongst their family and their friends because we're all in this together. Yeah. We've so, got so, to look after the planet, the health of the planet, in the way that we look after our own health. Yeah, this is so really. I want to switch it up though, Jeff, because because um, I want to I want to move it to to Marie for the next question, and and then yes. go into some questions we're getting from the audience. Um, oh, okay. So, so one of the things that the average person is seeing is that there's some urgency around climate change, but the difficulty is that you can't see CO two. 
what you know the story of CO two? What is it offering the everyday reader, as as you mentioned, Jeff, uh, who is trying to grapple with the with the scope and scale of the climate crisis? Marie, can you weigh in here on what that message would be? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, and I will start off by saying, you know, that, um, and, we, and we do mention that we have some discussion about this in the book, when it comes to seeing climate change and really feeling its impacts, um, you know, for the, the biggest impacts have historically been in the global south and continue to be in the global south. However, it could be argued, you know, that increasingly it, that, you know, those of us living in the global north are now seeing the impacts you know, I just saw an article that this year was um, the, a record-breaking year in terms of hurricanes in the Atlantic. Um, you know, think of all the folks, all the communities on the West Coast that have been impacted by forest fires. So in terms of seeing climate change, you know, I would argue that we're, we're seeing it now. Most communities have felt some impact, whether they're aware of it or not, we're all experiencing it. And even, you know, the coronavirus is something that's affected everyone globally to different levels, of course, but scientists are just beginning to understand the connections between deforestation, loss of biodiversity, and the emergence of um, deadly pathogens. So, um, so our health is completely connected to climate, and um, and in terms of of feeling the impacts, I you know it's happening today. It's here. Um, but to answer your question, <laughs> uh, what I will say. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, when we think about carbon emissions, uh, for example, I think most of us are used to thinking of, you know, the gas that comes out of um, out of our vehicles. But, uh, you know, we, especially in the global north, we're consumers. Um, that's actually how the book starts off, is talking about uh, a little bit about consumerism and how, you know, we're so used to, to you know, having access to all these products, yet we're so disconnected um, with the actual supply chains um, and which are increasingly complex and international and you know there's no way of really um, it, it, one can't even begin to fathom like where um, where our products are, are sourced because they're so complex especially when it comes to the chemical industry so where I think the story of CO2 is um, is a bit unique um, in contrast to other books discussing climate, discussing um, decarbonization solutions, where I think it's a bit unique is, uh, is that we're really shining light on, on a, the chemical industry in perhaps a way that's more detailed than certain people care about, uh, getting you know, a bit into the, the chemistry and everything. But um, frankly, before I started my PhD, I, I, wasn't, um, I didn't study chemical engineering. I wasn't aware um, of... of um, all these, um, you know, all these uh, feedstock chemicals that go into making all these key products. And it's not just making like, um, you know, things we would, things that might be labeled as a chemical product, say at your local drugstore. It's also things like, as Jeff mentioned, like pharmaceuticals, um, right? Just all the, the plastics that we use for food packaging, um, things like fertilizer, like most products we use in our day-to-day -day lives at some point have origins in the fossil mm. industry. Yeah. That, that's I, I, loved, I loved your coffee cup story in terms of sort oh, of when you when you go that. to when you go to buy a cup of coffee and you you have this this uh, polystyrene or polymer cup and we just don't think about you know the CO2 footprint associated with a coffee cup. And um, I don't know, that's one of the things that we talk about in the book. Well, I, I had to go to a, a question from the audience because we, we have quite a few and, and, <clears throat> and funnily, a lot of them are coming from Jeffrey Ozen because uh, they, they signed in. Oh my in goodness, Germany. no. So, so I don't know who actually <clears throat> behind these, some of these questions, but- um, I have ask. nothing to do with them. <laughs> <clears throat> um, so the, the first question I'll ask is, is how, far along are we in reducing the um, the cost, I guess, and the amount of renewable energy required to, to capture and reuse CO2? I guess, I guess the, the point of this question, the way it's framed is that there's an argument out there that a lot of things that 
we need to do could just be done by directly using clean electricity, right? Rather than mm -hmm. this, this process of creating fuels and stuff. But you know, what is your answer to people who say, well, why don't we just use the clean electricity directly? Um, I can, can I take that, Jeff? Just yeah. When I, I think mm -hmm. I can answer. <laughs> um, well, I think, um, you know, a point here is that, um, you know, wherever possible, uh, electrification is a fantastic idea. You know, if you can electrify our cars, let's do that. We are not claiming that we should be using fuel made from CO2. Uh, it's better to just electrify the cars directly, as an example. But where um, this comes in is, you know, there are a lot of industries where electrification is not a solution because the problem is not um, just, oh, we need a, a clean source of power. As I mentioned before, there are many processes where a, a hydrocarbon is needed as an input, as an ingredient to a chemical process. So there we can't just use electricity, we actually need a chemical. So that's where there's a really strong argument for using carbon dioxide and <clears throat> hydrogen, uh, you know, where a hydrocarbon input is needed. Hydrogen, preferably that is sourced from a renewable source uh, like water electrolysis powered by renewable energy. And of course, then, you know, we have a conversation about this in the book where, you know, if we're going to seriously consider water electrolysis, we better also consider water desalination because, yes. you know, it has to be a sustainable process. So um, hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, it does. It does for sure. Um, another question that came in is more about the use of CO2 to, to help to decarbonize um, the cement and, and, and concrete industry. I, the question is around, um, you know, what is the potential impact in terms of reducing worldwide CO2 levels if this was if this approach would be to would be to be de deployed globally uh, at a large enough scale. Um, you know, obviously, a lot of the different applications you're talking about, different products that could be made, each of them have their own kind of, yes. this is their carbon footprint. If we could replace this process or this chemical with CO2, then we would reduce the emissions by X amount. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of like ranking things based on the biggest emission reduction impact? If the cement industry would probably be up there as, as one of the well, highest. One that we like to quote is if you look at the use of concrete in different countries, concretes and cements, I think it's true that in China, they used more concrete and cement in the year 2019 than every other country in the world added together since the invention of concrete and cement. And so you can get an appreciation from the scale of that particular process in terms of what's going on. <clears throat> and so that, that would have um, a massive impact. Um, and because, you know, well, yeah, I'm, I'm not an expert on the cement industry, but <laughs> that would be an example, basically. But yeah, to, um, in terms of, um, you know, impact in like, in terms of how many, what's the emissions mitigation potential? Yeah. Um, numbers vary quite a bit because it really yeah. depends on um, how people draw out their life cycle analyses. Uh, but there seems to be um, some, um, uh, some acknowledgement that um, if, if, one, um, if we were to produce a significant amount of our minerals, i.e. our cement, as well as some, um, some uh, key chemicals from CO2, um, that it could potentially mitigate emissions around uh, around 13 to 15 percent, and yes. so so it's not insignificant, right? 13 percent is not insignificant, um, but it's not huge, right? So so that's where um, you know <clears throat> impact. It's the emission mitigation is really mm. going to come from switching from fossil-based um, energy to renewable energy. That's where the emission mi mitigation uh, solution really needs to draw from. Where, um, so carbon utilization, however, has the potential to offer some mitigation, but really mm -hmm. it's, it's a strategy to address those hard to decarbonize sectors like cement making, um, like steel making, um, and also to displace, as I mentioned earlier, to displace uh, fossil fuels from chemical manufacturing supply chains. Yeah. Sometimes we're asked the question, 
um, about, um, well, if you keep on utilizing CO2 and so for, from the air and from smokestacks, I mean, we don't want to go CO2 negative. We don't want to go below industrial levels. We don't want to cool the earth. And it turns out if you do a back of the envelope calculation in terms of how much CO2 excess is in the atmosphere, which is what, about 410 parts per million at the moment from 297 or so in the Industrial Revolution, I did a back of the envelope calculation for 160 years. So we actually have plenty of, of CO2. And so I don't think we have to worry about cool, I mean, we are often asked that question. You can't go on using CO2. You don't want to cool things too much. So anyway, there's a little bit of trivia. Okay. Um, we have a great question here that I, I think is important to ask. Um, <clears throat> it's coming from Bruce Stevenson. It says, I, I think that you both see this book as an important part of science communication. Do you see this as an important role for scientists such as yourselves to, to communicate these kinds of complex issues in this way? And what are your hopes from that perspective for this book? Oh, absolutely. I think that we don't necessarily do the best job that we could be doing in terms of uh, communicating science. And in this particular case, that's one of the reasons we put this book together. It was very important to get out this story that there's more to CO2 than, than basically um, a molecule creating um, the, the greenhouse gas problem. I, I think, we, we're looking at this, I mean, in a sense, when I was thinking what we've written there, it's a, it's a piece of, of a global Manhattan project, mm -hmm. basically, I, I think, uh, that we're looking at. And as I said, we're all in it together and we all have to work together, basically, to take care of this problem and, 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 and do it fast. Uh, we have to find solutions. There is an existential threat. I mean, we're feeling the threat in a pandemic at the moment. You know, and, and, you know, potentially this could be far worse in terms of, of life lost and property loss and, and, and things like that. And so um, basically the goal is, is net zero emissions, this 1.5 degrees centigrade that Marie mentioned. And we have to be knowledgeable of how to get there. You know, we have to. And so this book is a, a step in that direction. I was thinking it's almost like a, a thesis on a, a global Manhattan project and Mireille and I are trying to defend it in a PhD oral, in a sense. Yeah. Mireille, do you, do you see yourself as a, as a science communicator, which, which, you know, from my perspective, I think is increasingly important these days. Yeah, you know, well, honestly, I, I didn't <laughs> really. Until <laughs> very recently, I decided, sure, maybe um, I'm the science communicator, but, um, so I, I do, um, I have some very close, very dear friends and colleagues who are, who are really involved in science communication, who have made it their careers to do science communi communication. And one thing I will say is that, you know, just because you're a scientist does not mean you're a science communicator. And I don't think all scientists should be science communicators, in fact. <laughs> um, I do think, however, that all scientists um, you know, all scientists should be advocates because if we're not speaking up, someone else is going to, right? Um, we can't leave a void for, for other voices um, that might spread disinformation or misinformation. So I, I think, um, you know, science communication uh, is, is a skill. Um, some folks are exceptionally uh, talented. Um, at it. Uh, I had the opportunity to write a blog post last week for a university um, uh, press um, uh, themed week and I wrote about science communication and frankly like the biggest thing I wanted to get across was just name all these fantastic folks who have done an exceptional job of communicating um, um, uh, issues around the pandemic to everyday people and to non-experts, um, right? And especially in uh, during COVID, there's been a lot of noise. There's been a lot of non-experts sharing their opinions and it's hard to wade through all, all the messages. So, um, so I really, uh, I am very thankful to the folks who have dedicated their careers to science communication because just from this project, like I, it is, it's very challenging is all I can say. Mm. 
Yeah. So, you know, if, if CO2 is kind of the, um, I don't want to say it, Brad Pitt of molecules, it's more evil than that. So we have to find a more evil <laughs> character. Um, you know, is there another, is there another uh, story of X molecule in your, in your uh, futures as far as? Um, yes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. We're going to we're going to write a trilogy. Yeah, right. I didn't tell Murray the, the next secret. <laughs> well, you know, we were going to put a subtitle. Uh, this was the most mis. Um, um, what, what was the word that we were going to use? Um, maligned. Yes, we were going to call it the most you called it maybe the devil molecule or the most you know, maligned molecule, but this is really, we've got to change the conversation on this. I mean, solving this energy crisis is possible. You know, we seem to have most of the tools exist now, right? I mean, if you look at the UK absolute zero policy, you know, if you look at the net zero policies and so forth, you know, we have to start working with technologies that exist now. And we do have these and we have to scale them basically and we have to do it fast. I mean, you know, some of the things that we work on in universities are sort of adventurous, you know, high risk, futuristic. But, you know, these have to be scaled really quickly. I mean, you know, we, the, normally going from an idea to um, a technology in an industry can take 30 years. And we're talking about large scale technologies here. Mm -hmm. So I think it does make sense to basically scale. I mean, upscaling is key. You know, everything I read, it's all to do with upscaling and so forth. So this is where the policy decisions and business decisions and, and so forth have to be made. But there's, there's a lot of social engineering going to be involved. If you look at some of the key takeaways uh, in the book, um, a lot of them involve civil society and the changes that we're going to have to make. Yeah. Uh, and so forth. So I, I, we're, we're, get, we're getting close to running out of time and, and there's a lot of questions that were asked that quite frankly are, are, are getting into the weeds of you know technical weeds. So uh, we'll, we'll yes. save this for another day. <laughs> but I, I wanted to give you each the opportunity to spend three or four minutes with, with closing remarks. And then, um, and, you know, and as part of that, um, tell people where they can get this book and why they should get it. <laughs> Why don't we start with you, Marie? Yeah, um, so what do I want to say? Um, you know, one, a message that we, we try to drive home in the book is that, you know, this is not an either or kind of situation. And we're going to need all kinds of solutions and solutions are happening. Um, so when it comes to CO2 utilization, we're not just saying we need to use CO2 to make chemicals. What it really involves is we need uh, we need an expansive renewable energy infrastructure. Um, that uh, that is a requirement to do any CO2 utilization in a sustainable manner. We're also going to need some sort of hydrogen economy to produce hydrogen in a sustainable manner. Manner that is also a requirement for CO2 utilization. And we're going to need water desalination technologies, as I mentioned. Um, so the point being, um, these are not like either or options. They are all necessary and they all need to be integrated to create a truly um, um, sustainable um, economy and sustainable supply chain. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, uh, renewable, uh, renewably generated electricity is, is key to all of this. And that is really the key to reducing our emissions uh, rapidly. And it is possible. Um, I think, um, I don't know if I want to say I'm hopeful, but with the election of um, Joe Biden, I think we're, we're starting mm -hmm. to lean in a direction of hope. Um, and, you mm -hmm. know, uh, we're, we're here in Canada and, <clears throat> um, and, you know, whether we like it or not, a lot of our climate policy is very much informed by what goes on down south. And, mm -hmm. um, and I think it's exciting um, to look how, uh, the Biden campaign has arguably been receptive to a lot of grassroots climate organizing, um, such as the Sunrise Movement. So it's exciting to see that there is a dialogue uh, going on between grassroots organizations and um, and those and decision makers. And I think that's actually something new and something we can get excited about. Um, yeah, and I guess just you know 
to quickly end, um, you know, on with, with the book, um, I'll say that we we do try to be um, we try to be real <laughs> about the situation, um, and but at the same time, the book is very solutions oriented, um, and we we try to offer um, a deep dive, perhaps deeper than some people want, <laughs> in mm. some examples of uh, of cutting edge technologies driving CO two utilization. Um, you know, but the fact is utilization is already here, uh, you know, and at the end of the book, we provide a long list of companies uh, from around the world um, and a lot of them, uh, companies, sorry, which are already transforming CO2 into all kinds of cool products. So the book is really just a starting point and we really encourage readers to check out these companies to explore further um, and I'll end by saying, you know, it's a really exciting time uh, to be in this field and there's new science emerging every day. And um, and also, <laughs> sorry, I keep uh, coming to my final point. Um, you know, I think a lot of us got excited by the news that um, Pfizer and now another uh, medical company uh, announced um, that they have a vaccine that seems to be quite effective. But uh, you know, a challenge in the case of the Pfizer vaccine is that this um, the the vaccine has to be stored at extremely low temperatures on the order of negative seventy degrees. Celsius. And how do we store that? Using dry ice, which is <laughs> that Good one. And currently there's a global um, shortage of dry ice. So this is, you know, this is a very um, timely, very real way in which CO2, whether we like it or not, is still critical to, you know, um, yeah, to our well-being. Good point. Jeff, uh, we got two minutes. Um, it's I know leaving the last word to you could be a gamble, but uh, why don't we go for it? <laughs> well, I think Marae covered, covered it beautifully. Um, and I agree with everything she said, especially the Biden plan. Why don't I just let uh, you know the, the 10 recommendations that we have at the end of the book to lessen the impact of climate change? Uh, number one was education about the possibilities of carbon utilization. Uh, this will help people vote in terms of climate change mitigation that's needed. Um, we want people to start talking to their representatives and uh, to get involved in these reduction strategies in the family and the community. If you got 10 to go, we're not gonna make it in time. Okay, uh, <laughs> no, uh, let's worry about the carbon footprint associated with everything that we use in our activities. Um, we've got to start investing in carbon neutral and carbon negative technologies. Um, we've got to be carbon conscious, basically, in the way that we travel. Uh, we can think about energy consumption in our home, right? We can start assessing that. We might become vegans as well. We might be thinking about that. And so basically reducing our consumption whenever possible. And number one at the end of the list was evidence-based decision-making. Yeah, I think that's. I think that's that's how we more or less ended the book, and that was an important message, on on top of everything that Marie said. Great. Well, Jane's uh, weighing in here to to close off the uh, the session, but uh, thank you very much. This was fascinating. I can't <laughs> wait to dive in more deeply, and I commend you for the effort that's uh, involved in producing a title like this. Over to you, yes. Jane. All right. Well, thank you very much uh, for that really amazing discussion. There are so many questions and comments that came in. Mm. Uh, obviously, you've really started uh, a conversation uh, that will be uh, continued, uh, you know, with great uh, zeal. I'm just looking through the book here, and I see the ten points here on page uh, 206. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I do just. Uh, I want to. Uh, cap off uh, two important points that I heard uh, during today's discussion was number one is to listen to your grandchildren. Uh, and number two is that we have to use CO2 more than just uh, waste and place it within a circular economy. And I think uh, based on, uh, you know, Jeffrey's open opening comments and <laughs> some of the uh, things I'm seeing in the chat box here, is that we look forward to a sequel, which will be the illustrated children's edition. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the story of CO2 is available uh, everywhere. Uh, and so for those of you that want to order it for your uh, school <clears throat> libraries, it's available from all of the library wholesalers. 
It's available from our website uh, or from Amazon or anywhere that you choose to uh, buy books. So thanks to everyone that dialed in for today's launch. Uh, we saw people from Naples, Brussels, Ottawa, Kingston, New York City, Flint, Michigan. Um, so thank you very much. Thanks for uh, to Tyler for moderating this session. And uh, on November 30th, I'm uh, just going to do a plug for a session that we're doing on November 30th, and it's going to be a panel discussion about the five years since the Paris Agreement, where are we now? Uh, oh, Mireille yes. will be part of that panel. Uh, so please uh, join us for what will uh, likely be a very uh, interesting discussion. So have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much.